You did a conference call today with all your strategists worldwide. Uh, you spoke to Kenro, is it? Kenro Kawanasan. What correct. did he He's say? Our, was he working from home? Yeah, he was our Japanese strategist, and uh, he was good enough to be on the call. Uh, I think that uh, you know, I'm happy that all of our employees that I know there are, uh, are are safe at the moment. But there is a lot of fear there, and uh, um, you know, the, the, clearly the markets are reflecting a lot of that fear today. Uh, the Japanese equity market overnight and, and the and the Japanese bond market overnight uh, rallying significantly. All just you know, show this risk aversion and and uh, and fear a uh, fear of the worst, which we hope it won't be right. at the end. But uh, at the same time, the markets have to price for that. We had a banner up earlier, hours before. I think it was something like panic in Tokyo or something. And the media uses these words, and maybe it's panic for some people. Obviously, it is. What do pros do? Whether it's the crash of '87 or the Asian, the many Asian crises of 1998, or what you witnessed this morning. Do you do, is it like just do something or is it like grab a Starbucks and calm down? Well, I think it's it's much different when you have something like a financial crisis where uh, we are very good at analyzing that. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, uh, I think, trained to think about market interaction. We're think, uh, trained to think about what the risks are to our various markets based on events that even if you can't see them, you can at least analyze them. But, but something like this, a natural disaster such as this and some of the knock-on effects is much more difficult. So, uh, um, you know, you have to take a pause and think right. about, uh, you know, let's think about really what's important right. first, and that's the lives at stake as opposed to, you know, really what's going right. on in the markets. Let's bring this up first, this Aussie yen uh, chart. This is what we were looking at earlier on the terminal, and this is a 20-year chart. It shows that cyclicality, our jersey. Now, this isn't your, this isn't what you're dealing in every day. But my answer is if you look at the great Asian axis of Australia up to Japan, it's very cyclical, isn't it? Well, it, it is, and one of the reasons is is that Australia provides most a lot of the commodities for uh, for the manufacturing nations further north. So whether that's Japan or China, uh, or, or uh, some of the Southeast Asian uh, countries, uh, Australia is very cyclical right. and very dependent on these countries for a lot of their exports. Uh, let's bring in Hans Gutter Rudiker of BNP Paribas joining us from London. Hans, you've been talking about Aussie yen. Bring up this chart, and Hans, this is a short-term chart of Aussie yen, and shows way over on the right side of that chart, folks. Victor, nail the right side of that chart, and you can see the drop down. Hans, put in perspective how the foreign exchange markets are reacting to this crisis. Well, uh, we have actually to look at uh, that Japan is the uh, third largest uh, economy in the world. Now you have, uh, with the anticipated slowdown of that economy, you have as well a commodity effect, you have knock-on effects onto other co uh, countries. We have actually to analyze uh, what is going to happen uh, to, to, to Asia as an aggregate, because that is very important for the commodity angle. Now, uh, when you look into into the direct uh, trade effect of, uh, of Japan. Now, um, obviously, uh, facilities have been hit uh, when you uh, uh, look at uh, uh, their possibility to, uh, to, uh, to um, use up oil in the industrialized process. A lot of that had been destroyed. So that means you have an initial negative impact uh, on the oil side coming from that side. But on top of this, and that is what many people forget is that China is already slowing down. So what you right. have is a Japanese <clears throat> environment which is weaker and a Chinese environment which is a starting point of a slowdown. And that is what the market well, is trading on. That I'm, is the reason why the Australian dollar is weak. Let's bring up Elegant Chart 1. Why don't we, folks? This is one of the nuances. This is what Ira Jersey and Hans Gutter Rudiker do every day. The covering of the Asia risk on trade. Okay, so it's fear. Get out of the markets. And I just laid across this chart back two years. Aussie yen and Aussie dollar. So this is the Australian dollar versus the Japanese yen. That's the white line. And you can see it really come down on the right side there versus Aussie U.S. where we see less of a, of a reaction. Hans Gunther Rudiker, what did you do this morning when you see these disparity of pairs? Well, uh, the initial reaction is that uh, you look uh, to those currencies uh, which are most vulnerable uh, to a shock which very likely is going to become uh, to some extent global. So that actually means you do not like to have uh, any yield exposure. You do not like to have any commodity exposure. You do not like uh, to have currencies into your portfolio which uh, suffers a small currency syndrome because of a lack of uh, liquidity. So you sell all that. 
and then you have to consider what to buy. Yeah, and obviously, they, there are two currencies Ira, uh, coming out here, and that is the Swiss and the right. dollar. Ira, jump well, in I here. think this is a great point that Hans is making, because even though China's slowing down, our view at Credit Suisse has been that the global economy actually was in the midst of a, uh, of a growth momentum slowdown anyway. So this is, could just exacerbate some of these risk-off trades. Uh, it's a follow-on on it. What yeah, did well, you we do were going to slow down market? anyway. What? Well, well we, were, we, we were talking about buying dips uh, in, uh, in, in yield. So when we were up uh, at 370 in the 10-year yield, we, uh, we we like the market. A lot of people got short. A lot of people didn't like the market, and uh, and all of the analysis from the various fixed income research teams had suggested that we were going to have somewhat of a slowdown over the next several uh, months. So you went long so we bonds, went long. price yep. up, yield down. That's, That's right. what we so, got. Yeah, and we got. We're getting to the bottom end of what we thought was going to be the range, which was around 325 to 350, 360, something like that. Um, uh, you know, the question is: Is there going to be another exogenous shock to the market that could push mm -hmm. us outside of that range? Um, and, uh, you, you know, again, this goes to my point earlier that it's difficult to analyze, you know, exactly what those exogenous shocks would be. Right. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, we're hoping things will get better, and we'd rather be sellers here right. of the race market well, than buyers. Folks, is Japan wealthy? Earlier this morning on Bloomberg Surveillance, that was one of our themes. I spoke with Stephen Roach, non-executive chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia, senior fellow at Yale University, and I asked him if he would consider Japan a wealthy nation. Japan is a very wealthy nation in terms of per capita GDP. The wealth has not increased much in this two lost decades, and, and the odds are that they'll continue to draw down some of that wealth as their population ages. But, you know, this, this earthquake should not be viewed as an end to the, the prosperity and development of a very strong and powerful economy. Uh, Steve Roach, his book is The Next Asia. Hans Gunter Redeker with us from B&B Paribas and Ira Jersey at Credit Suisse with me here in New York. Hans, if I bring up Japanese reserves, foreign exchange reserves, they're a wealthy nation, and yet they've got all that debt. Which is it? Are they a wealthy nation as they withstand this disaster? Well, when you look at uh, the ability of that country uh, to save, over the past uh, decades, you have uh, built up uh, substantial foreign assets, which are about 60% uh, of uh, GDP. So that actually means that it's uh, quite uh, important built up of uh, assets. When you look at uh, domestic balance sheets, very split. When you look at households, then they have reduced debt levels quite significantly. When you look at corporates, very high cash levels. When you take the combination of both, then you see that uh, their, uh, that their uh, debt levels are at about 60% uh, of GDP. You compare that to other countries, so for the, in the United States, you have the corporate sector, banks plus uh, household at 310%. You have in Australia a number of 620%. So right. Japan or the private sector stands no. out, but then you're quite right. It is a public sector what matters. Well, and, it and, is the ability to fund the JGB market. And within this IRA, the yields are low. There's all this debt. I mean, Steve Roach is saying they're wealthy. Hans Gunter Redeker is saying they're, they're sure. wealthy. Sure, Kawa of Credit Suisse would say they're wealthy. Does the debt matter? Well, it does it. It does at some level, but I, I think in Japan, in particular, you have, do have very high savings rates, so they're able to uh, basically fund their debt uh, internally. So it's basically because of the high savings rate, they don't have a they have a captive buyer basically of their um, of their of their debt. Um, particularly Should we JGBs. do that in the United States? Well, it, it, it's if, an you, if you think idea. about if you think about the math of this, in the United States, we have a savings rate, call it plus or minus five percent, on about ten trillion dollars of income, so it's five hundred billion dollars a year. Uh, our estimate is for fixed income asset uh, issuance this year net um, mm -hmm. of all taxable fixed income assets. This includes corporates and governments and everything else of about $1.5 trillion. So we actually need external financing because in the right. United States we're not saving enough in order to purchase all of this debt uh, just because our savings isn't quite enough. Now there is some savings from the corporate sector, et cetera, that goes into that, but it still doesn't add up to $1.5 trillion. Are our yields going to go up? You said we're coming down. Are we just going to go right back to 3.70 at some point? Uh, we, we suspect that at some point, and, and certainly right. if, if things normalize, we could easily get back up to 3.5%, okay. which is our year-end forecast. Thank you so much for coming in today. Ira Jersey at Credit Suisse and Hans Gunter Redeker of BMP Paribas.